worship together. Um, we're going to sing a, one of my favorites, and so please sing with us. Let us feel your presence as we sing I'll Fly Away. Will some glad morning when this life is over
Good morning. Welcome to worship with us at Spanish Fort United Methodist Church. My name is Beth Allen. I'm the Director of Congregational Life, and on behalf of our staff, we welcome you, whether you're joining us on Facebook Live or on our YouTube channel or website or even on the radio. Um, if you are live with us this morning, um, Brittany, our Youth Director, is monitoring our Facebook, so we would love for you to interact um, with us on our Facebook Live. We are excited to be here and excited to be streaming this service. Um, we will continue to stream services, um, and if you will watch your email in our Facebook page, um, we will be sending updates um, as we get them as far as our progress in um, moving back to the sanctuary. We are anxious to see everybody, but for right now, we will be continuing to stream our services. I would like you for, to you to join with me as we affirm our faith. We do this each week um, using the Apostles' Creed, so I'll invite you to join with me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Pastor Bill Price, and we're going to spend some moments in prayer here today. This is a significant weekend as we talk about assurance of our salvation, but also thankful for this weekend being Memorial Day weekend as we remember the sacrifices of those who have gone before us and have given us the freedom and liberties that we have even to be able to worship freely today and to live stream the service and be on the radio as well. So we're thankful and appreciative of the sacrifices for so many uh, in our country, and we remember those today and are thankful. We pray none of us will take those for granted, even as we freely worship the Lord today. And also, as we come, we remember many who will be traveling in the course of this weekend, and also we continue to pray for so many who are still impacted by the COVID-19 and the impact of that, as we know today. 
So will you join me where you are in your home, those who will be listening on the radio later today, I just encourage you to spend some moments here with me as we go to our great God in prayer. So let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for this day. This is your day. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you for the significance of this day as Memorial Day weekend, but also, God, as we remember and give thanks for the greatest sacrifice through your Son, Jesus, for us. And, Lord, we are doubly blessed for freedom and liberty within our country, freedom and liberty and assurance that we have in Christ of our salvation. We thank you, O God, as we recognize our blessings this day, even as we've been impacted by this COVID-19 pandemic. We thank you that we can still worship. And God, we can do that freely. We praise you, Lord, for your church. We ask your blessing and peace upon us as we worship, even in our homes. And Lord, places of business, wherever people may be gathered and hearing this, we pray your blessing and peace upon them. And we thank you, God for your goodness to us, for salvation in the name of Christ that is available to all, and even as we will share today the assurance of that that we have in Christ through your Spirit. Hear our prayers, God, for those in need, especially today. We thank you and praise you in the name of the Lord Jesus, who's taught us all to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hey guys, good morning. I am so glad that you are here worshiping with us today and that you are here at this time of Children's Moment. Now, I was so glad to see some of you um, this past week. So if you have your Miss Jennifer, make sure you have it at worship with you at your home today, okay? So make sure you take a picture and post that. But I'm so excited to be with you here today. And, you know, one of my favorite things, and I don't know if you have if you've done this before, one of my favorite things is in the morning when you're laying in your bed and all of a sudden you just smell the goodness of bacon. How many of you ever smelled how good bacon smells? It's cooking in the oven or in the microwave or on the stove, and you smell it, and it's, you take a deep breath, and you say, oh, there's bacon, and you jump out of bed, and you go to see, and there it is, that fresh, crispy bacon. The smell is all around you. It's everywhere. Well, you know, it got me to thinking about our scripture today. Bacon and Jesus, what does that have to do with each other? But the Spirit. We know that God is our creator and that Jesus redeems us, but the Spirit is what empowers us, right? And as God's children, we have the Spirit within us, right? And so today, I was thinking about that bacon, and I was thinking about what does the Spirit look like, right? It's something we feel when we close our eyes and we feel the wind blowing. We can see it in the trees. We can taste the bacon. We can smell the bacon. And it's a feeling that we have that empowers us and reminds us that we are His. So today, I want to do something special. I listened to a song on the way to worship this morning, and it was a blessing. And so today, I want to offer this Spirit blessing on you. So I want everybody to stand up at your home, family, kids, everybody. Put your arms out and put your heart ready for this blessing. So put your arms out big because it feels going to feel like a big hug, okay? So close your eyes and we're going to say this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, turn his face upon you. May his favor be on you for the thousands of generations, for your kids, for their kids, for, for eternity. May you feel his peace around you. May he go before you, behind you, around you, beside you. In the morning when you come and go, may his spirit affirm to you that he is for you. He is for you and that you are his child. May his spirit fill your soul so that you might show others and affirm for them that they are his child too. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I hope you guys have a great rest of your week. Amen. Thank you, Jennifer. Let's pray together for the offering today. Uh, we're greater together when we gather uh, what we have to help the world. Come, Holy Spirit, um, make us into givers. Uh, help us to open our eyes to see the needs around us and to respond quickly 
Uh, everything that you give is yours. Everything we have is yours, and we want to give it back with grateful hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we're talking about assurance this morning, I know there's no greater assurance than God's love or any love that will never leave us, never forsake us. And this, that's what this song is talking about. He won't let us go. And he's, it's as if the Father is singing to us. When it feels like surgery And it burns like third degree And you wonder What is it worth When your insides breaking in And you feel that ache again And you wonder What's giving birth If you can let the pain of the past go of your soul none of this is in your control if you could only let your guard down you could learn to trust me somehow I swear I won't let you go if you could only let go your doubts if you could just believe in me
I invite you to join me for the reading of God's holy word. Uh, This scripture comes today from Romans, the eighth chapter. Uh, We'll begin reading in verse 14 through 16. Just a couple of verses here, but very important verses and truths that we need to know uh, from God's holy word. So hear now the word of the Lord. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. And we cry, Abba, Father. It is the very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If in fact we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you for joining with me in the reading of God's holy word today. As we think about assurance today, I was reminded of uh, perhaps romantic films and things that we have seen where there's this poor guy who's in love with this girl and he doesn't know whether this girl is going to return the favor if she really loves him it comes out of it's a french origin but he has perhaps a daisy and he's picking the petals off of this daisy she loves me she loves me not she loves me she loves me not and supposedly the last petal will tell them whether or not that's really love and that's kind of a miserable position to be in isn't it not and i as i think about this even on a spiritual level my pastoral experience tells me that many wonder or doubt or held in certainty, maybe even about God's love for them or, or their salvation. Uh, Max Lucado tells a story of being dropped from his insurance company. He had one too many speeding tickets and a minor fender bender, which put him over the limit, even though it wasn't his fault. And so he received a letter in the mail informing him that uh, he was going to be dropped from their coverage and he had to seek coverage elsewhere. And as he reflected on that letter, he couldn't help but see or sense the spiritual parallel or tie-in that was there. And he says, many people certainly live in fear receiving such a letter perhaps from God. Some think perhaps they already have. And here's what he says. This is from, uh, straight from the Pearly Gates Underwriting Division. Listen to what he writes. Dear Mrs. Smith, I'm writing in response to this morning's request for forgiveness I'm sorry to inform you that you have reached your quota of sins. Our records show that since employing our services, you have erred seven times in the area of greed. And your prayer life is substandard when compared to others in your, like your age and circumstances. Further review reveals that your understanding of doctrine is in the lower 20 percentile and you have excessive tendencies to gossip. Because of your sins, you are a high-risk category for heaven. You hope, we hope you understand that grace has its limits. Jesus sends his regrets and kindest regards and hopes that you will find some other form of coverage. That's how it goes as a slave, he says, who constantly lives in fear, not knowing enough, not doing enough, not ever measuring up. What's so amazing with this is I do see many and talk to many who are wondering about their standing with God or their relationship with God. But the scripture teaches us here very clearly that we can have assurance. God wants us to have assurance. We don't have to be in doubt or worry or be anxious about it. God loves me. God loves me not. God loves me. God loves me not. What a a terrible position, a really a miserable position that we might be in. But the whole plan of salvation is about God redeeming us, reconciling us, bringing us back into right relationship with God and the original design that he had in creation. Remember back in Genesis, Adam and Eve, prior to their sin and disobedience, they were walking with God in the cool of the day. It was a wonderful, marvelous fellowship that they had, communion with God, very personal, intimate relationship that they had there. But after the fall, after their sin and disobedience, it was a different story, right? Where were they then? The Scripture tells us that they were hiding They were hiding among the trees. They were afraid. They were afraid. The peace of God, the relationship with God that they had had been broken. And now they were separated from that. I sense that this is the picture of humanity that we see today. Paul is indicating here in the first part of these verses that there's a spirit of fear that many have. 
living in fear. It's like Adam and Eve hiding in fear. Out of step, out of relationship with God. And even those perhaps who have confessed Christ as their Savior and might be in right relationship with God still doubt and are held in anxiety over that relationship. But the good news is, the Bible speaks to us about the assurance of our salvation. As a matter of fact, that's one of the central beliefs that the Bible tells us about. And even in our own Methodist tradition, it's certainly central to our Wesleyan theology and church history. Matter of fact, in, back in the 1700s, John Wesley preached and taught about the assurance of salvation. And many in the Church of England in his day did not believe as Wesley did. They struggled with assurance of salvation and to believe that. But Wesley taught and preached on the assurance of salvation and the inner assurance of God's Spirit witnessing with our spirit about the assurance of God's love for us, just like it talks about here in this Scripture. So this scriptural truth is this. God wants everyone to be saved. And not only to be saved, to be assured of their salvation where there is no doubt, where there is no uncertainty about it. Again, I I share that many of the priests and those who were leaders in the Church of England in Wesley's time did not really believe in this type of assurance. They were worried that people would get caught up in their own inner experience and it wouldn't be truthful or real. Wesley was refused or they refused for him to preach and teach in some of the churches. But preach and teach about assurance of salvation he continued to do. And many of the early circuit-riding preachers in his day preached his sermons. And I might add, with great effect, and for, even in frontier America. Today, I'm going to be a, a circuit-riding preacher of sorts, and, and that I'm actually going to preach the bulk of this out of a sermon that John Wesley preached. It's in one of his 52 standard sermons. Uh, you can get this online as well. Many of his sermons are online Uh, And it's called the witness of the Spirit. Talking about, again, the witness of God's Spirit with our spirit that we are a child of God, bringing assurance to us. So first he talks about the testimony of God's Spirit. So what exactly is the testimony of God's Spirit? And how does God's Holy Spirit witness to our spirit that we are a child of God? And Wesley would indicate in his sermon that it's hard to put into words that for the language of mankind about the deep things of God. How can you really express something that's so subjective? After all, this is the Holy Spirit that we cannot see. Even though we cannot see the Holy Spirit, we certainly, as the wind, can see the effects of it and experience it in our lives. I like the lines of a modern-day country song. It has the lines that really portray this so well. Oh, Mr. Webster could never define... What's being said between your heart and mine? How is it that we can fully describe or put into words the love we may have for our spouse? How could we really put into words or or describe or define the, the love we may have for our child, for one of our children? There's no denying the reality of it. The connection that is there, that is deeply and profoundly spiritual and I think divine. This is not a made-up fantasy. This is not an idle dream. This is not wishful thinking. It is a true witnessing of God's Spirit to our spirit. Here's how Wesley, what he said more directly about this testimony of God's Spirit. He says, The testimony of the Spirit is an inward impression on the soul, whereby the Spirit of God directly witnesses to my spirit That I am a child of God. That Jesus Christ has loved me, given himself for me, and that all my sins are blotted out. And that I, even I, am reconciled to God. Powerful word here because he's saying God's witness is bearing witness with my spirit and confirming that my sins are forgiven. That's the first part of this. A witnessing that my sins are forgiven. And the other part is confirming my identity as a child of God. When Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit came down from heaven as a dove and landed on him. Then the Father spoke from heaven 
and gave witness to all who were present that day. And the voice from heaven says, This is my son, the son I love. In him I am well pleased. The affirmation of the Spirit came down and God's voice spoke out. And I, although we may not audibly hear the voice of God, I think this process is repeated in every believer's life. Again, we may not hear the audible voice of God, but it's the Spirit who comes first to bear witness with our spirit. As John says, we love God because he first loved us. So the witness of the Spirit really precedes our affirmation of that in our own spirit. Indeed, without the Spirit's coming first, we would not have this witness. Really, the gospel is a love story. It's a story of God's love for us. And in any love story, someone has to make the first move. If there's no first move, then the relationship doesn't happen, does it? What we're saying here in this is that the love story of the gospel, God's love for us, is that God makes the first move. He loves us first, and then we respond in like manner. As John says, we love him because he first loved us. So God's Spirit comes to witness to our spirit first. And then there's the testimony of our spirit. How can we know the veracity of this witness? As I mentioned uh, about Wesley back in his day, there were those who were very critical of this. They thought people were deluded or self-deceived. This was some psychological mind game that they had. It wasn't true or it wasn't real. So how do we know this is true? And Wesley put out four markers of this to indicate the truthfulness of it, the veracity of this witness of God's Spirit with our spirit. The first, he, he says, these are marks to protect us against presumption or self-deception. And again, this is in his sermon on the witness of the Spirit. The first thing he says is repentance. Repentance precedes pardon and assurance. The Scriptures teach us and instruct us, even John the Baptist and Jesus both said, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. On the day of Pentecost, it was Peter who says, Repent. And be baptized for the remission of your sins. Repent and your sins will be blotted out. Acts 3.19 Wesley says here, He pardons and absolves all them that truly repent and truly believe His holy gospel. Remember the story of the prodigal son we talked about in the previous sermon? The prodigal son who was in the far country apart from the father. He came to himself, the scripture says, and then he confessed his sins. He came to himself and he confessed his sins. He says, Father, I have sinned against you and against heaven. And then he came back and he was received fully by the Father. But his confession preceded, his con confession and repentance preceded the pardon and assurance of the Father. We've been talking about this scripture all through this series. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But this is the first step toward assurance, he says. And it's true for every child of God. Now the question is, have we truly and earnestly repented of our sins? The second mark that he says that brings us to this assurance is what he called heart change. Or the scripture calls it the new birth. Being born again of God through His Holy Spirit precedes this assurance that we have. The Scriptures talk about a change bringing us out of darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God, and even a spiritual resurrection. Paul talks about this in the book of Ephesians. He says, You He has made alive who were dead in your trespasses and sins. This is a new birth experience that Jesus talked to Nicodemus about. The reality is that God loves us where we are, no matter where we are. But the other part of this is God's love does not leave us where we are. It's only the beginning point of this journey of salvation. It's like those who are graduating from high school. We call it a commencement. It's a commencement. You know, commitment, commencement means we're moving forward. We're leaving behind our high school time and we're commencing forward. We're moving forward into the next stage of our life. It's really only the beginning. 
Dietrich Bonhoeffer talks about cheap grace. And he says it's leaning into the grace of, and love of God without real discipleship. My uh, seminary professor called this sloppy agape also. Repentance always leads us to heart change. Pastor Rebecca was sharing in her message last week about David's confession of Psalm 51. And in that, what she was saying is so true and bears to this today. It's not just about a confession of our sins, but it's more than that. He's asking for a clean heart, a change of heart. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. It involves a transformation of our heart, not just a transaction of receiving God's grace and our sins being blotted out. But it is a changed heart that God is really after in this relationship. So this heart change is the second part of what Wesley uh, talked about leading to assurance of our salvation. And I really like this next mark. He calls it humble joy. Humble joy. And he, he puts together these two great virtues, humility and joy. Wesley was clear, and I think certainly the scriptures talk about our salvation really humbling us. We come like the publican who prayed to God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Or maybe as Peter, when he was trying to walk on the water and he sank, and he simply cried out, Lord, save me. It's utter dependence upon the mercy of Christ. We simply cry out, Lord, in your mercy, save me. There's nothing I can do to earn this or deserve it. I am clinging to your mercy alone. That is humility and trusting in Christ and Christ alone for our salvation. The other part of this, he says, is, is humble and then joy. There's joyfulness here. The Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes into our life, the Holy Spirit brings fruit. Galatians 5, and 23 says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Ninefold fruit of the Holy Spirit. But what he's really focused on here is joy. And why is that? Do you think the prodigal son, when he came back, wasn't overjoyed? When he received the love and acceptance of his father? His guilt, his shame, his, not only his sins, but all of those things were removed. They were gone. So he had this overwhelming sense of joy in his life. The scriptures talk about joy unspeakable and full of glory. And the last thing that he talks about here, the last mark that he talks about is obedience and keeping God's commands. The scripture says this is the love of God, the sure mark thereof that we keep his commands. And our Lord himself said, he that keeps my commands, he it is that loves me. So love and obedience are always tied together, inseparable. Our desire now is to please God and to honor God in all of our actions. As we said in previous sermons, we are looking to be holy in all of our conduct. So here are these four marks. Repentance, heart change, humble joy, and obedience. If we can say in our lives that these things are being experienced, are true, they're sure signs of our salvation and assurance of our salvation. So why is this so important? And I think, obviously, we might know the answer to that from the outset. I came across a moving story of a couple, John and his wife, Lori. They were working together on a youth mission trip to Nebraska. And there in their mission trip, they met a young teenage girl named Amanda. Amanda was the same age as their son, Wesley. They had learned that Amanda had come from a terribly abusive family. Eventually, they were to take Amanda into their own home and work toward adopting her. And she had been with them for quite a while. They had two other sons. And after conferring with them and conferring together, they decided to officially adopt Amanda. At this point, 
she was a little bit older, but they were able to adopt her, and her name became their name, or their name became her name, Amanda Foote. She was even given a new birth certificate. Now John and Laura have three heirs, their two sons and Amanda. They uh, had love and affection toward Amanda for a very long time leading up to their official ability to adopt her. And one, a friend asked them, if, did they feel any different once they went into the courthouse and they made the adoption legal and official? And John, the husband, said, absolutely. He says, when it was official, there was a huge change in myself and Lori. It was sort of like when you see your newborn child for the first time. Imagine that. And for Amanda, there was a change in her too. His words now are very important. Here's what he says. Now she knew she belonged. There was no doubt about it. She knew we were her parents. There was a new sense of belonging and acceptance that she had, that she hadn't experienced before. And I think that sense of belonging is so important. It's the glue that really holds relationships together. And how greatly that parallels what the Apostle Paul is talking about here. God is giving us a new name, His. God is giving us a new legal standing. We are now His responsibility, His heir. God has given us a new family, the church, new brothers and sisters in Christ. But God gives us something that not even John and Lori could give Amanda. God gives us His Holy Spirit. It's like, almost like God giving us His DNA. And it's as if, once again, God is speaking over us. You are my son. You are my daughter. That I love. And you... I am well pleased. This gives assurance to our hearts, a sense of belonging and acceptance. But there's one other part of this that's so important that I want to share with you. One other reason why this is so important, this sense of belonging also gives us boldness in our mission as a church. I want to go back to John Wesley and his experience. He was an Anglican priest. He was... Uh, and then went on mission to America, frontier America, colonial America, which was a failed mission for him. And on his way back to England, a couple of times there were great storms at, at the sea, on the sea, the ship that they were on, and they were fearful. Certainly John Wesley was fearful. It, it tells us in his, in his journal that not only was he fearful for his physical life, but he was fearful for his soul. But on board the ship with Wesley was another group of believers called Moravians, German Moravians. And while Wesley was so afraid and so fearful for his life and for his soul, these German Moravians were singing. They were singing. And it inspired and motivated John Wesley to say, these folks have something I do not have. There's an assurance in them that I lack. Wesley, as we know, survived that ship voyage back to England. And he then went on to visit the Moravian village and one of its leaders, Peter Bowler. And there, as he talked to Peter Bowler, Bowler insisted that faith comes instantaneously. The moment we believe, the moment we believe, the moment we confess, we have forgiveness and assurance. And he says it gives us three freedoms. Freedom from sin, freedom from fear, and freedom from doubt. That struck a chord in Wesley because that's what he lacked. Bowler even says that Wesley started weeping, started crying. And he said, how can I have this faith, like you. 
How can I have the sense of assurance that you have in your life? Wesley left from that meeting to Boulder. It wasn't long after that that he went to the church on Aldersgate Street and had his now famous Aldersgate experience. Someone was reading the preface to the book of Romans, Luther's preface to the book of Romans, and part of that preface has these words, the Spirit makes the heart glad and free. Faith is a living, daring confidence in God's grace, so sure and certain that a man would stake his life on it a thousand times. Wesley went on into that meeting and felt his heart strangely warmed, as we now know. And his famous testimony, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone, for my salvation. And he said an assurance was given me that he had taken away all my sins and saved me from the law of sin and death. That was May the 24th, this day, in 1738, almost 300 years to this day. And when I read that and know that, it's just as moving to me as when I first read it years ago. And why is that? Because it's the same Holy Spirit that wants to give witness to our spirit that we are a child of God. Friends, I, I simply would ask you today about assurance in your own life. Has there been an assurance given to you that your sins are forgiven, that you are a child of God? And as Luther's words in question, is your faith in God's grace so sure and certain that you would stake your life on it a thousand times? May we pray. Lord, may your Holy Spirit come to fill us now. Lord, help us to repent where we need to repent. Change our hearts where they need to be changed. Fill us with your humble joy. And let us desire to do your will, O oh God. And Lord, may we, even as Wesley, feel our hearts strangely warmed by your love to know that indeed our sins are forgiven, that we belong to you, Lord. Give us the spirit of adoption, O oh God, that we know that you are our children. We are your children, O oh Lord. And you, we may hear you speak over our lives. You are my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, our response song uh, could have been written about Amanda in the story that Bill told today and is woven throughout, the words kind of woven throughout his whole message today. So let's sing this. You unravel me with a melody You surround me with a song of deliverance
Pastor Bill Price, once again, I do pray that it is well with your soul and the humble joy of God's spirit and the assurance of God's love is in your life. Thank you for joining us today. I pray you'll join us next week at our live stream at 10 a.m. and on the radio at FM 103.3 at noon. Again, the peace and grace of Jesus be with you. Thanks be to God. Amen.